everyone for, for coming out and uh, spending your evening in part um, with us at Skydeck. Uh, this is the UC Berkeley Cloud Meetup. Um, this is our second uh, meetup. We're very excited to be doing this. Uh, we have a number of speakers tonight. I will be making short presentations. There will be plenty of time at the end to ask them questions. Uh, and then um, after the sort of formal questions, there will be plenty of time to to ask uh, them individual questions as we're milling around and networking at the end. Um, so I'd like to start off first by thanking our three speakers tonight. Um, the first speaker is Jerry Jung. He is a PhD candidate in the Department of Astronomy at Berkeley. Jerry works with the Breakthrough Listen Project. Uh, this is a follow-up project to the search for extraterrestrial intelligence uh, happened at Berkeley at the SETI Research Center. He will discuss his recent work and the technologies in his workload. Um, the next speaker will be uh, Kashi Sahakian from Grove. Uh, Grove is a uh, company in the current Skydeck cohort. Uh, they are developing a turnkey accelerated Java virtual machine for databases, Hadoop, big data analytics, um, and Kachik will discuss the work in Grove and the development of their product and potential applications. Uh, the third speaker tonight will be John Felter, with whom I work in research, teaching, and learning. Uh, John's presentation will discuss the scalability and portability of Kubernetes um, without the pain of managing an entire cluster. Uh, so those will be our speakers. Um, I'd like to thank the co-organizers for tonight's um, session, um, including Bill Allison, who's the uh, UC Berkeley Chief Technology Officer, uh, Anthony Swen, who I lost, there's Anthony, uh, Director of Programs at the Division of Data Sciences, uh, Sybil Chen, the Program Director of Skydeck, Gordon Peng, the Program Coordinator here at Skydeck, and Amy Neeser in Research IT. We have uh, a number of sponsors. Um, we have our sponsors are Catherine Carson, who's faculty head of data sciences education and professor of history. Uh, Carolyn Wynette, the Skydeck executive director. And Jen Stringer, our campus deputy CIO, um, who will give us a welcome in a moment. Okay, so but before we do that, um, the further welcomes. Um, the question you should be thinking is, um, you know, why are we doing this? What's the purpose? What's our intent for having a UC Berkeley uh, cloud meetup? And um, and the short answer to that is, there's a lot of really interesting cloud-related work that's going on on campus. And with a campus that's this um, sort of diverse it's sometimes very difficult to, to, to know what folks next door are doing. Um, and so this is an attempt to bring people together to kind of learn a little bit more about some of the interesting things that are happening in the cloud and to provide an opportunity that, um, for, for, for follow-ups in that regard. Um, so, um, I'd like to take a poll. Um, the poll is, um, raise your hand if you are a academic, a faculty, or student uh, currently on campus. Is that to be staff also? Uh, staff is going to be the next one. We can be staff also, yeah. So I think I saw like 10. Okay. Um, second is staff, including you know IT staff on campus. So a lot of folks doing IT on campus. Uh, raise your hand if you are currently uh, engaged in one of the Skydeck companies. 
Okay. And uh, raise your hand if you are an alumni. Woohoo! Right, so a lot of them. Alumni is what? There. Okay. Great. Um, we've recorded all that. <laughs> so the next thing I'd like to ask you to do is, uh, getting back to what I was just saying, um, take a moment to introduce yourself to someone who is sitting nearby, um, and um, tell the people that I uh, share what you do and what drew you to the meetup. I'll give you like a minute for that. <laughs> I'd like to introduce Carolyn Matt, the Sky Dad Executive Director. Hi, everybody. I just want to say hello and welcome. Um, we love IT, we love cloud, we love all things, we love working with staff and startups. Um, you're going to hear from one of them this evening, I think. Um, so, but I just wanted to welcome everybody. If you don't know what this is, um, you are in the world's top global accelerator. This is how we move ourselves, right? Um, you're also in UC Berkeley. This is UC Berkeley. They lease the space, right? They lease the space here, um, so it's not campus owned property. But this is a Berkeley program. What's really special about Skydeck is that we are a startup accelerator and we accelerate and we get funding and we have investors and demo day and all that stuff. Um, in fact, the, the startups are now frantically getting ready for demo day. So, um, but we are Berkeley. We are Berkeley. Berkeley did this. Right? The campus didn't say, let's find someone and do it, and that'll be great. The campus said, we are doing this. And so we did. And it's grown like crazy in the last few years. We have 120 startups and residents. Two right floors of the building. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. We're just getting applications pouring in for the next cohort. And wonderful advisors, Bill Allison is an active advisor here at Skydeck. And we partner with a private venture capital fund, the Berkeley Skydeck Fund. That fund invests in the startups here, and that fund is going to share, per contract with campus, half of all management profits with Berkeley. So, super annotate, and I drop here. Um, if, when you become a giant unicorn, and you have a huge IPO, um, Berkeley's gonna hit lots of revenue. So that's what we're about, is funding Berkeley through finding super cool hot startups. So, if you have questions about the program, ask one of the founders here, we've got some founders who are or loves or Bill or myself and enjoy the evening thanks so much Thank you, and Jen Stringer our deputy CIO will say a few words so um, you get welcomed three times today which is <laughs> exciting um, and it's hard to follow that act because it is an amazing place in terms of being both Berkeley and an incubator but I want to sort of put a particular spin on this meetup um, storytelling is really important in terms of what we do, and tonight we're going to hear three different stories, um, all talking about the cloud and how people have learned from what they've done and experiments that they've done. And part of this meetup and part of trying to pull people together to have conversations across faculty, staff, students, Skydeck, you know, Skydeck entrepreneurs is to ensure that we're actually telling stories that are meaningful across the different groups. And so I guess I would encourage you to sit tonight and think about the stories that you're hearing, pepper the folks with you know, intriguing questions from your lens, because you're bringing that unique lens, whether you're a faculty member, a staff member, whether you've got different roles and different hats. But this is our chance to actually participate in a community of not of the other, and not just of ourselves. And so I would welcome um, you to sort of put your hat on, but also try to sort of experience the uh, storytelling from the different lenses that you come from. And then um, have an engaging conversation at the end. So with that, are you welcoming the first? Are you, the, we have the We're first We're ready speaker. to go, Jerry. You wanna... There you go. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. So I'm Jerry Jump. I work with uh, the Bridge to Lucid Project. And um, I, I should start by saying that our primary computing is not done in the cloud. It's our in-house in structure. And I'll go into uh, some reasons for that. But you know, um, 
And also, I'm, I am a PhD student, so I work on uh, algorithm development. So some of the infrastructure decisions are also, I'm not responsible for them. So, <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, um, I'll, I'll share my side of the story, and, and uh, uh, excited to hear what you guys have to say. Uh, uh, SETI stands for a search for extraterrestrial intelligence. So primarily we do that with a radio band, so radio frequencies, because uh, there's a certain level, one of the reasons there's a certain level of transparency for you to be able to uh, send signals over interstellar distances. So things we're looking for essentially are technological signal that's originating from space. Um, and um, what are some of the challenges? Well, uh, essentially, uh, we collect a lot of signals in the radio frequency, and because uh, we as humans use a lot of technological signals in the radio frequency, so uh, one of the main challenges is to be able to identify these interference signals and to filter them out. And uh, to do this, we collect large volumes uh, of data, both in terms of the real-time rate and also the volume that we store. And um, uh, Contrary to most other sciences, because this is such an open-ended question, we're looking for a technological signal, there's not really a definitive strategy, because no matter what you say is that this is what the signal should look like, somebody else can come along and say, okay, but why are you making all of these assumptions? You could, you could have looked at something else, right? it's like almost in, in science fiction. Okay, so the Break for Listen project uh, started in 2015 and aims to conduct the most comprehensive search uh, that we have ever done. And currently we partner with the Green Bank Telescope, which you see a picture here, Parkes Telescope in Australia, and uh, we're starting deployment uh, in the Meerkat already, which is in uh, South Africa. And uh, the, the mission is to uh, you know, survey a lot of stars and galaxies, and to do that, you know, our data rate is, is essentially one petabyte per day in terms of the, the uh, uh, the time series. I'll go into a little bit of what that means. And uh, uh, what we do, we, we, we don't store all that time series. Instead, we form uh, spectrograms, uh, which are two-dimensional data types, and store about uh, 10 terabytes per day. And uh, so the, the infrastructure needs for this, because we don't do real-time processing, and uh, because there's no definitive you know, target, uh, we need uh, cheap storage, essentially. So, just to, for people who are not familiar with radio frequency, you know, what is a radio frequency data? Well, uh, the raw data can be think of as time series. So these are raw voltages that, uh, that, that are collected from the antenna. And we take Fourier transforms as a function of time, and you see the, the power essentially represented in this spectrum versus time uh, called a spectrogram domain. And that's, the, that's most of the data type that we store is the spectrogram. So, uh, because the data rate comes in at, on site is very high, it would only make sense to collect the data uh, um, on site, and uh, we do that first. Uh, first data, the IQ data, comes through FPGAs, which does a uh, process called the polyphase channelization, which splits up the data it's, it, so that you can further process it in parallel. And those go into uh, uh, compute servers, uh, 64 servers. This is uh, a, a Green Bank telescope. Uh, they use GPUs to call uh, 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 Kupti, and the spectrograms are then stored uh, in the storage servers. So this is uh, mounted over MFNs. And uh, uh, the work that I do essentially are offline processing. Uh, so the data essentially gets pulled back into the compute servers from the storage node and processed. So, uh, in the past couple of years, we have also developed an offline infrastructure here in Berkeley. So we used the, uh, the UC Berkeley Co-location Data Center. There's a link there that some of you might be familiar with. So, then we build our own node there. We also use uh, uh, the other NFS. And uh, so, uh, we essentially have separate storage nodes and compute nodes. The storage nodes each have 100 terabytes of storage. Uh, but there's no GPU, 
and, uh, and then there are compute nodes, which uh, do have the GPUs. Uh, and the data format of choice right now is HDF5. So, so why do we build the cluster in this way? Uh, so there's the, the, essentially we need to store a large amount of data. So one of the main missions of the program is to make available, publicly available, a large amount of open data. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, because for, for a project with this amount of data, we are not many people, we're around 10 people in the project total uh, with uh, essentially two IP staffs. So uh, we want the system to be easy to maintain. And uh, you know, we want to be able to avoid catastrophic failure because the data essentially is where all the cost is, is in. So if the system fails and you lose the data, it's very simple. Um, so the performance then sometimes you 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 are cutting down the performance because because of the other considerations. So why don't we use the cloud? Well, it really just comes down to one reason: is because uh, even until now, uh, the data storage is more expensive in the cloud. And uh, uh, at our facility here, we for one petabyte we use uh, you know, um, seventy k to. to Purchase the hardware plus 500 per month, uh, you know, to maintain the hardware in terms of cooling and power. Um, so, and my work is mostly on machine learning. So, what we do is to, uh, so I, uh, you know, for training, you can create a training set directly on uh, the uh, uh, on on the compute node in whatever format you want. So you can. Can really speed up the I/O, so the training is, is can be optimized at least uh, in the aspect of having a single node. And uh, the inference, however, is always I/O bound because of the setup of the uh, you know, both in terms of you have to decode HDF5 and in terms of uh, have to pulling it over. It's not a distributed system, so it's a uh, it's a uh, it, you have to pull from one storage server to one compute server. So. I'll just briefly mention, you know, some of the signs that we do. Uh, you can do supervised deep learning. In this case, we we look for a signal known as fast radio burst, and uh, uh, deep uh, a deep learning algorithm that uh, we developed was able to find a lot more signals than uh, than, than traditional algorithms. And uh, I don't have time to do the demo, which we have a little uh, essentially data query. Uh, uh, served, this one served on the cloud, which uses deep learning and representation learning to compare the similarity of different signals. And we can also have generated models uh, uh, in terms of using GANs and this predictive model using the LSTM uh, to, to detect anomalies. There are also some experimental projects on using IQ data and uh, as well as some uh, uh, some GPU accelerated traditional algorithms. So all of these, you know, uh, all of things that I develop needs GPU. So uh, the inference will always be I/O bound. So that's all. Great, thank you. Yeah, yeah, so you mentioned that data is made, made available for sharing. I'm just wondering how is that found? Is it, you get the 10 or 100 terabyte of storage, but then you also mentioned some petabyte storage. So how much is available online for people that want to Ah, So data? right now, I think we have about two petabytes uh, available. So it's 100 terabyte per node. Okay. So, yeah, in, in that facility here at Berkeley, we have about, I think, one petabyte. We have about 10 numbers there that fill the bill. Like a lot of you expect for this data. I mean, some astronomical catalogs are 120 years old. Right. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So the project itself is... is Can you uh, repeat the question, too, uh, just the, so... Yeah, the question, the question was, what is, what is the expected longevity of the data? How long do we want the data to be non-corrupted? 
Uh, so the, 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 the project itself is scheduled for 10 years. Uh, uh, you know, after that, it's a, it's a really good question. My personal opinion is that we should at least combine the current strategy with some real-time detection because there are certain things, because right now we essentially store everything. There are certain things that you can really roll out uh, in a real-time scheme. So that will drastically reduce the amount of data you have to store and ensure they are they, you know, survive for a long time. Could I suggest that it has to be deleted? There should be a congressperson. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have time for, for, for more questions after. Let's move on to our next uh, presenter. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Fachid from Grove, one of the current uh, Skydeck core teams. And what we develop is hardware acceleration for big data computing. And everyone knows the problem of the explosion, explosive growth of the data and AI adaptation. And most load is already broken, so processor speed cannot scale with it with the rate that big data is growing. But organizations and, and research do not take this into account. They need more and more computing power. And the world is thinking about heterogeneous computing or the task-specific hardware to help processors to manage processing all the data. And ASICs are the most per performant accelerators here. But once they deployed, they, the algorithms there cannot be changed. But for example, in financial world or in uh, or, or or in research, some algorithms are, are changing monthly or yearly. So FPGAs are the next performant performant platform, which which are almost as performant as ASICs, but they still can be configured. And this is why uh, all big clouds like AWS, Microsoft Azure, Alibaba Cloud, Huawei Cloud, rushed and installed FPGA instances and opened them up to for researchers and organizations. And uh, but they see little traction from the organizations and or, or developers. This is because big data developers do not know how to program FPGAs because programming FPGA is like designing a new ASIC. It is take, like taking at, least, at average $10 million and two years of development to, to develop something. And uh, here Grove comes with a one-click solution that is FPGA designed processor course that know how to process big data workloads and they are giving from 5 to 30x boost for various big data applications. So we are deployable on every cloud that supports FPGA boards, or we can deploy it on-premise by using boards, whether from Xilinx or, or Intel. Uh, so as I told, we have FPGA implementation of various course, function cores, that are used mostly in, in big data, for example, string manipulation, <coughs> linear algebra, searching, sorting algorithms, regular expressions, etc., etc. From one side, and from another side, we have processor-based. We call it Grove API integration. It is like CUDA for a video case. So this is to be integrated into various softwares. We have like. Example implementations with Elasticsearch and Spark, Spark for benchmarking for demo reasons. So here we benchmarked to one uh, Spark operation and one Elasticsearch operation. First is, so we are benchmarking machine generated log file analysis and we are benchmarking a Spark like operation. Uh, the orange one is processor only compute time and the black one is processor plus FPGA compute time. So we see that in 500 gig log file data it is 15 seconds versus two minutes. And also we benchmark with Elasticsearch a part of the indexing. So, so it is not the search part, so it is 
pre pre search so it is when you have raw data and you input it into Elasticsearch and the system starts indexing. So to index very raw, unstructured, log file, Elasticsearch that one log takes 75 hours and uh, with growth it takes six hours. So what this means to to users? It means that you can derive uh, critical insights much, much faster or you can have the same performance using at average 10 less server nodes, which would keep your infrastructure simpler and will reduce your infrastructure cost when you scale and when you maintain it, because it also will heavily affect on the, on the power consumption of your system. Um, so target use cases we are, we are researching and trying to do POCs now are cyber security, financial applications, retail, online advertisement, and re research. And use cases are like security analysis, and fraud, fraud analytics, high frequency trading, uh, genomics sequencing, natural, uh, natural language processing, <coughs> etc. Et so we started the company with Artavast, and then Ashish from you uh, super clear house who joined us as a business part person. Uh, we, uh, we, besides three of us, we have also five more FPJ developers coming from Synopsys, Qualcomm National Instruments. And we got uh, two great advisors, former senior VP of National Instruments and former CTO of EMC. Uh, yeah, and at the end, I want to show one demo that we run on the AWS FPGA instance. So at the right, we have we are trying, we have 10 gigabyte of application log file, and we are using Spark to search the number of rows when the user have, uh, like access to access to the application. And when I run the query to count the number of strings, it takes this much time. So it is. Uh, 54, like if you, like it is from 5 to 6 seconds, it varies. And if we run the same on growth instance, uh, it is 697 milliseconds, so about 8 times, 8, eight times faster. Uh, so what, what does it mean from the money wise? So the query on only CPU took like 0 0.6 cent to, to execute, and when you are using the right instance with the right right software, it is taking 0 0.2, 0 0.02 cents to execute. Or if we scale to monthly usage, it is $1,500 per for infrastructure or $580 for infrastructure. Um, I think that's all, thank you. Uh, and do we have time? So I we can have a question while we're transitioning. We can have questions at the end. So if anyone has a question right now they want to ask. So are there any specific FPGA platforms that your software stack is targeting? Or is it uh, wide open Intel, Xilinx, anything? Or? It is. It is. All new uh, new data center acceleration cards from Xilinx and from Intel. Then the new newest versions that, that are working from AWS Azure or on -prem. Yeah, so we are trying to be hardware agnostic and, and software agnostic as well, and platform agnostic as well. Thank you. We'll have time for more questions. My name is Jonathan Felder, I'm a systems administrator with uh, UC Berkeley's research uh, teaching. So this spring, uh, I've been helping to support um, the Data 8 uh, class, which is currently running, uh, well, which is currently offered by edX. And for those that don't know, um, edX is, a, is an online learning destination um, that offers free courses from a number of universities profits and, uh, and also uh, other institutions. 
And so uh, anybody can go to edX and they can sign up and take one of these courses that's being offered. And so potentially any course could have thousands of students taking it at any given time. And so uh, the Data 8 course in particular is called using what's called the Jupyter Notebook. And the, uh, the Jupyter Notebooks, they're, they're open source uh, web-based applications uh, that contain live code and so basically, students can, can oh, yes. enter information into the notebook, click a button, and get a response from it. So you know, if they're learning how to program or whatever, they can they can put code into that notebook and, and get the result. And they don't they don't have to know anything about how the the underlying system is working, or they don't have to deal with with configuring anything on their own machines or anything like that in order to to make this work. They, they just need a machine with a web browser uh, that's just capable of going going to the site and using it. And that, that makes things like really easy for them to basically get going and, and learning. So um, each student gets their own virtual environment. Um, so when they, when they sign in, they, they see only their notebook. They don't see anybody else's. They get their own storage which persists throughout their, their engagement with the course. Um, and, uh, and again, yeah, they, they basically can just focus on, on learning, which I think is, is, really, is a really nice feature of that. That's so um, in this case, the cloud is used to provide both scalability and reliability for these applications because each, each student, when they log in, you know, it kicks off a, 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 a Jupyter Hub notebook for them to work in and, so, and it's an independent environment so they, they, um, they can uh, you know, do their work and everything. And so uh, the, the, the notebooks work using <coughs> Docker containers and Kubernetes. So the notebook software itself runs in a, in a Docker <coughs> container and a Docker container is a self uh, sort of contained execution environment, right? It has everything that a program needs to run, and as long as the underlying platform is capable of running uh, Docker, your Docker container can run there. So that means that uh, that basically you just, you know, as an instructor or, or whomever is responsible for putting together the course, they just can get, they get their information into the Docker container, and then these Docker containers are made available um, to be executed as necessary when the students uh, need to use them. And so what Kubernetes does is it actually, it's a, it's a container orchestration framework. So basically you have all these Docker containers running and what Kubernetes ensures is that, um, that the underlying resources that the Docker containers need to use are available, that they're being uh, used efficiently and that uh, if any part of the system has a problem, uh, it can detect that there is a problem and it can stop the Docker containers and restart them and, and make sure that, that the system uh, continues to work. So it's self-healing. And so what, what does this all mean, basically? Well, uh, it means that um, we don't have to plan for the, uh, the max use case. So, Typically, uh, when we run systems like this, we have to say, oh, well, we, we need to support thousands and thousands of users, so we need to make sure we provision enough hardware to support all those users. And if at some point it turns out that we have uh, a fewer uh, than, than expected, um, you know, we're not, we, we don't have to, to continue to maintain infrastructure to, to pay for all of, of that extra capacity and uh, similarly if we have a greater than expected uh, number of users we can scale to accommodate that you know the system doesn't just grind to a halt or something because there's an unexpected amount of load. Um, also um, a small team can support a lot of users in virtual environments and this, this has kind of actually surprised me because when I started working on this I mean, I knew a little bit about Docker, and I'd created uh, a few Docker containers myself, um, but I'd never really, you know, used Kubernetes and really know very much about it. Um, 
and, and it's really impressed me how just like so few uh, support resources are needed to support so many classes and users. Like that's uh, been, been really eye-opening to me because a lot of other systems that I've supported in the past support far less users and require a lot more time. So for me, this was, was really, really neat. Um, and the, the other thing that's really neat is that Kubernetes is cloud agnostic. So in theory, you, you, know, you, 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 you get your Docker containers. Docker containers can run anywhere that Docker is supported. And so then um, Kubernetes, uh, in addition, is, is also cloud agnostic and is capable of provisioning resources on any cloud environment that you decide to use it on. So like if you're running on AWS, you don't really have to necessarily know everything about how AWS works. Instead, Kubernetes knows how AWS works, and then you can just focus on making sure you know your, your stuff is, 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 is running there, but you don't have to do so. Um, you know, you don't have to you don't have to like learn everything about AWS necessarily, or you know, Google Cloud or Azure. We we have uh, we have we have a few classes running on a variety of cloud environments. So that means that uh, basically you can, you can run the system on whichever provider will give you the most free cloud credit or is the cheapest. And that's, <laughs> that is exactly what we're doing. Um, so that's, that's also like super cool. Um, so when supporting this, um, you know, uh, like wh what did I do exactly? And, and the, frankly, the answer is not, not like a whole lot. And that in and of itself, I think, is a neat story to tell. Because again, the system is being used by so many people all the time, and, uh, and as a support person, I'm, you know, I'm kind of like just waiting for for something real bad to happen or some kind of, <laughs> you know, and, and I'm just like, wow, this thing just keeps going. It's so cool. Um, but I, I did have to do uh, some config changes, right? Um, some security updates. These are these are these are typical support tasks. Um, and we did have one major uh, issue uh, in the spring where the grader, um, which so basically when, when students uh, final do their assignments again in their Jupyter notebooks, they can click a button in, in the Jupyter notebook to submit that assignment for grading. Well, that that. The, the grader itself didn't break, but the linkage between the notebooks and, and the grader did. And the primary reason why that happened is because grader's not Kubernetes, I think that's probably why that happened. So, so we're going to move that into there, and we're going to start uh, we're going to start writing that in Kubernetes as well, probably. And you know, that problem will, will go away. So again, um, so yeah, I mean, again, I just want to reiterate how amazed. Um, I have been with how easy to support this uh, this particular uh, class has been, um, and again uh, the, the 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 greater issue. Um, what was sort of I guess interesting about that is that the, what stopped working was actually a component that we expect the provider to provide for us. It's, a, it's called the internal DNS, which is basically every time you run a, a machine. Uh, in Google Cloud, it's supposed to get a name which you can use to reference it from anywhere within your project. Well, for some reason, that, that stopped working. And so that kind of highlights sort of an interesting challenge when we are um, when we're doing this work, which is this stuff is changing all of the time. You know, um, you know the, the providers are constantly making changes to the underlying infrastructure, making it better, adding new features, and, and having sometimes some problems along the way. And so it's sort of interesting how we we basically have um, we rely on these providers to, uh, to provide some of these management capabilities for us. And it's interesting to see you know what happens when, when there's issues. Like there always are. Um, and um, I also believe that that this kind of of, of model of, of using thing or using. Uh, packaging software into containers and using orchestration frameworks like Kubernetes in the cloud. I feel like this is the future for large-scale uh, software deployment. Like I, I, I just I can't. I mean I don't know. I can't imagine like a better way to run a system like 
this because it, it scales. It's you know it, it's, it's fairly inexpensive for what it does. It's super easy to support, and um, I, I just I can't imagine why we would do any, anything else when it comes to these kinds of systems. And um, as a result of, of this effort, I, I believe that we're going to be uh, RTL is going to be supporting probably some more of these sorts of classes. Uh, Coming, uh, in the upcoming months, I think I'll be even starting to fall. So, pretty excited about that. Pretty much it, I guess. Just my experience supporting um, sort of a highly available, uh, large use cloud application. Great, right. thank you very much. Okay, so we'd like to open it up uh, for questions for any of our speakers tonight. Uh, questions. So question for John. Um, when you take one of the classes that you're running on one cloud provider, and you pick up your containers and your Kubernetes and you move it to the other one, was there anything that surprised you when you were moving from one cloud provider to another or anything that you didn't really expect or was it really just completely seamless? Well, to be, to be clear, um, I'm only supporting this this one particular class right now, and it has run on the same platform for the amount of time that I've been supporting it. I, I do know that we are supporting um, similar efforts on, on Azure, uh, and, I, and I believe that there probably have been some more issues there, because that platform isn't quite as mature as, as uh, Google's is. I mean, particularly because Kubernetes is a, uh, is a Google, it's originally a Google project, so. Probably not too surprising that their their offering uh, probably works with it the best, um, but uh, but I do know that with some of the other the other uh, providers there have been um, some issues, but by and large they're all coming up to speed because I think they all realize that you know this, this is like a this this isn't going to go away. This is a thing people are going to want to do, and they better support it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my question is. Uh, uh, what's the current scale uh, in your uh, example, and what is the capacity you can see? You see that uh, scale can you know reach to? So, I don't have exact numbers. I do know it's thousands of uh, of students just in this one particular course. Um, and the other thing is is that uh, signups tend to be really you know high at the beginning of the course and they tend to trail off a little bit. I, I, I hesitate to say this with a, with a lot of authority, but I, I want to say there's like maybe there was like 20,000 students maybe signed up at one time and then and then throughout the course you know the numbers dwindled, but I think it still was in like five to, to 10,000 10, students I believe were, um, were, were, were using this even for the end. So it's a from your experience, it's a, almost a hit the ceiling, or the, hit the um, maximum, or it's a still have a room to uh, to go. Given given the um, the amount of effort uh, I had to spend supporting this, I'd say we didn't we didn't, we didn't hit any ceiling um, at least the, this this semester. And I mean, as far as I know, I mean there is definitely a ceiling there, just because there's a limit on the number of resources that you could potentially provision and how many credits we've got, but I saw no evidence that we were uh, coming coming within um, being impacted by that in any way. From, yeah. Thank you. What's the type of profile? You have 5,000 users. It's a data science class, so what's the typical profile, the type of compute that, that is getting used by a, a given student? Because it's not just like a web transaction; they're actually doing research, right? Or they're right. running. Well, they're, uh, the the class is is, is in Python. I, I think is basically is, is is the language that they that they do a lot of the programming in. And um, I think each student gets uh, I want to say it's it's two gigs per per uh, per virtual environment, and then they have a certain amount of, 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 of persistent storage because containers are not persistent. I mean, containers by their very nature. <coughs> Or throw away. So anything that you want to keep needs to be stored outside of a container. So there is they, they have system, and I, want, I don't. I'm not sure um, how much storage each student receives, or if it's limited. I, I want to say like it's like 10 gigs, but I don't. I can't. 
edX is more of a portal right like you basically go, go on to edX and they present all of these courses that you can potentially sign up for and then when you sign up for a course and click on it it actually takes you um, to uh, the Jupyter Hub instance in Google Cloud right like you click on it and it, and it opens the link and it goes, to, um, it goes to that but the interesting thing is the student themselves they don't really have any idea that there's all of this uh, amazing cloud technology going on in the background, which is super neat. I mean, just, just click on it and view it. As to, as to how exactly that, that integration works, I mean, like I, I do know, like they, they set up a course, and then, and like I said, it's like a link that goes then to, to, the, uh, to the cloud environment. I don't know if that answers your question exactly. Yeah, maybe, maybe there's more detail. You mentioned the course is free and that there's thousands of people taking it, mm -hmm. but there's also a cost for the, for the cloud infrastructure. But about how much does it cost? I know that we receive blocks of $25,000 credits from Google. Uh, one of the challenges of this project is to actually um, figure out how we can centralize this billing on campus and actually, you know, like instead of relying on the uh, graciousness of Google to keep giving us credits. Uh, as to how much it is on a per student cost, Anthony, you might know that. I think it's, uh, um, I think it's right now it's even under a dollar per student per, per student pay. Yeah. Right. A lot cheaper than a very, textbook. Very, 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 oh, that's, that's, I mean, that's the thing too. Like, I mean, it's way cheaper than textbooks. The Jupyter Hub uh, notebooks actually, uh, in a way, become their textbooks, um, which is pretty cool, yes. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, first, you mentioned about 10 gig of persistent storage and 2 gig of RAM. Is there limits on the number of compute, the number of cores a student, the CPU cores a student can access, and that's one. And number two, um, I'm not sure how these classes are, but let's uh, let's say if a class has group assignments, like out of the few hundred students in the class, they form groups of five students and all the five students would have to share what they are doing, collaborate on the assignment they're working together. If a class has that kind of setup, this infrastructure provides that kind of shit. I, I hear that it's all specific to student. Their storage, their resources are all virtualized and very specific. Are there, is there capabilities and provisioning to share Resource, partial resources to partial identified users, not across everyone. Um. Um, so your your first question was about limiting uh, access to the number of cores. I I don't know if we currently do that. What I will say is that um, Kubernetes you can uh, tell it like approximately how much we load and, and how many containers to put on each node. So you can kind of govern resources in that way and if Kubernetes sees that a particular node is becoming overloaded or becoming overworked, it will automatically you know, either provision more resources or it will, it will uh, it kill containers on, 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 that are currently running on one node and spin them up on another one. So that's kind of one of the really neat features is, is again, these, these are the sorts of things that typically system administrators would have to do and the system just does it. Uh, as for collaborative environments, I, I think that would speak more to potentially the whatever limitations might be present within Jupyter Hub or Jupyter Software itself. I, I, I don't think like Data8 does that kind of, okay. of uh, Collaborative effort, um, so I, I, I don't really, I don't really know. Yes. So my, my question is sort of related to what you just explained. So this, uh, the the scaling is done automatically by demand on the network. Right? So essentially, if you set up 
uh, originally the Kubernetes cluster and you ended up having half as many users as you expected, it would just automatically you know, kill those nodes and then your cost would actually go down. So your cost is how much you actually use. Right? Okay. <coughs> Two questions. You mentioned that um, the storage is temporal, and so if students want to keep something, they have to take it off. What yeah. happens if they want to work on it again? Do they have to pull it back in? So, um, so the thing is, 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 is Docker containers, right? So the soft, the, the the environment in which the software runs is 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 ephemeral, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so the, those are considered throwaways. So the system at at, at any time can it, can it can kill containers, it can move them, it can spin them up on others. Um, each time a container starts up, though, it, it knows um, based on metadata passed from from when they log in, right? Like who who this person is, and, and within the container, it knows to mount persistent permanent storage on behalf of that user, which happens over NFS. Yeah. Okay, cool. And then my second question is for our Berkeley data science students who use Jupyter, um, they don't go in through edX, right? We're not. No. Uh -uh. Okay. So, so Berkeley so has its direct, own. Right? Yeah, Berkeley has 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 actually I think a, a few different Jupyter Hub instances that we currently run that we're working on potentially bringing all un under a single sort of portal that people can click on. But this is very, this is specific to edX and, and non. Um, non-Berkeley students, but there, it is being used um, by the same class on campus as, as well. I have a question for, for the Grove folks. Um, what are some of the, my question is, what are you, some of the sort of next steps or, you know, where would you like to take your technology next to sort of demonstrate in a more real world context the the gains that you can get from your from your technology. Yeah, the the, the next step we we take the technology is to we, we will start doing a lot of POCs on enterprises with the with the channel help from from Xilinx and Intel because at the end of the day we help to sell their boards. Uh, 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 yeah. This is the next step. So what we were doing until this point is what was, was developing the technology and generating the benchmark uh, the part partners asked from us. Uh, and after, uh, after this point, we will go into security vertical and financial vertical to, to test the technology in real workloads and in, with, with, with at the, at the scale and, and with the real workloads. Okay, thank you. Yeah. What's the reconfiguration time for one of the one of the units? <coughs> yeah. So the first time the the like firmware load time is 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 second, and the the time you also there is option when, for example, the firmware is optimized to do very good regular expression and not very good sorting but by the time um, died. Died. No. <laughs> but by the time your your workload changes and you have a lot of sort requests then the regular expression requests but this time you can dynamically reconfigure the firmware not not to erase and replace new one but dynamically reconfigure it this technology is called partial reconfiguration. This is new technology from Xilinx. So for partial reconfiguration, you can just replace like four or five cores. They can put other four or five cores inside the FPG on the fly, like in microseconds. OK, to be safe, many seconds. <laughs> question, the big question for Jerry with respect to the city endeavor. Uh, so are, are there any opportunities for, for your analysis being based on more on more special purpose hardware like FPGA? So we do use FPGAs uh, during the data collection. 
So that's uh, you know the streaming data uh, comes in, uh, the IQ data gets split by an FPGA. So we do this thing that's similar to a Fourier transform with an FPGA, just splits it into multiple streams, and those further go into GPUs to further process. Um, so my work is mostly using GPUs. Um, FPGAs are, you know, in my understanding for for machine learning work is very good for inferencing. Uh, in, in our particular case, since everything is I/O bound, uh, for inferencing, there's not not really need to accelerate the compute. But uh, yeah, uh, potentially, you know, eventually, if we move to uh, some kind of real time detection on the time series, it could potentially use FPGAs to accelerate inferencing. Um, you mentioned during your presentation that um, saving this data is possibly in that sort of idea of dispersal of this data because you cannot do real time uh, processing where actually there could be some part of the data that could be processed in real time. And in those cases, could uh, FPGA be used to do uh, any faster processing so that you can discard what you do? Yeah, essentially that's that's what I mentioned. I mean, FPGAs are are, are is a growing contender in fast inferencing for for deep learning. So uh, I I think we you know hopefully in the in the next couple of years we will add a real time processing component in addition to what we currently do, and uh, you know, potentially FPGA would be a solution. Other questions? Okay, I want to thank everybody for coming out. We'll see you in uh, in one month. Thank you very much.